Okay, no one. So this is Nissan Leaf. And Nissan Leaf is a smart and electric car. And like any other smart car, it has an app. And through the app, you can control various features of the car, like a setting of view the air condition temperature. So far, the story is pretty boring. But here comes the cool twist. And the cool twist related to this guy. And I'm sure a lot of you recognize him. How many recognize this guy? Okay, uh, I expected to more people, but this is Troy Hunt. So those of you who are not familiar with him, really invited to check him out. Security researcher, owner of a lot of cool tools. And one of the things he's, done, he do, he's doing is a workshop called Hack Yourself First. And in this workshop, he teaches people basic hacking skills. And one of the time he did this workshop, one of the participants in the workshop owned Nissan Leaf. So after the workshop, this participant go home and try the things he learned at the workshop on the app uh, for Nissan Leaf. And what he found out was that all the requests from the app were totally anonymous, without any authentication. Meaning, in order to perform a request the app is doing, all you have to know is the publicly available data, like the car ID, the VIN, and you could execute any request the app is doing. You can read the full story on Troyhunt blog, just Google Troyhunt Nissan Leaf. But basically it means that if the app is able to change the air condition temperature, you can also do that to any Nissan Leaf car in the world, just by knowing its VIN, which is pretty cool when you're thinking about it. By the way, don't worry, it's an old story, so I pretty much hope they already fix it. But anyway, I'm pretty sure your reaction to the story is something like that. Who oh, no, knows how they did such an epic failure? Uh, it's not something you do by mistake. And I also think that way. I'm also a developer. I'm writing code for the last 10 years. But I want to offer a bit different view on this story. Uh, I want to show some compassion to the Nissan Leaf developers. And I want to tell you our story at Saluto, what we dealt with, and to explain what I think that. So as I said, I'm working at Saluto. And at Saluto, we are trying to help people with their technology. Me and I'm sure each one of you had a lot of smart devices at your home, like smart cameras, smart TV, laptop, smart printers, mobiles, whatever, you name it. And you don't always know how to get the most out of it. For example, how I can connect my phone to my printer and print from it. So we actually to try to help people with that. And the main thing we are doing to, to achieve that is with an, an app. And one of the things you can do from the app is content an expert uh, in fast and convenient way. And the expert can guide you on how to do side stuff. For example, how to set up your printer. <laughs> so if we get back in time, uh, early 2015, we started to work on the app. And one of the things we asked ourselves was how we are going to authenticate the request from the app. After all, I don't need to convince you that um, authenticate and authentication is important. But we weren't really sure how. And you're probably thinking, why it's even a question, right? Authentication is simple. Just add social login, and that's it. You have authentication. It's not really uh, complex. But we didn't want to do that. And the reason we didn't want to do that was uh, because it affects the user experience. If you add social login to the onboarding flow, what the user had to do when he download the app from the store and before he can use the app, you can affect the number of users who actually start to use the app. And we didn't want to affect it. We want to have as many users who actually download the app and start using it. And we are not the only one who's saying it. This is a quote from Optimizely. We talked about 56% drop. Now, even if the numbers are a lot uh, high from the actual numbers, if it's, even if it's only 20%, it's still a lot of users. And we don't want to lose all those users just because we need authentication. And as I said, maybe this was something that uh, the guys at Nissan Leaf had in mind. We don't really know what happened there. But maybe they faced a similar issue and they did not know how to uh, solve it. Anyway, we decided we are going to change the assumption that uh, login is essential for mobile app. And we are going to find a way to authenticate without authentication. And we decided to go for it. Uh, and I started to work on this project. It was a pretty long project. Uh, it was, again, two years ago. And it took around half a year to find a solution, build the backend, um, build the mobile client. But it's working. It's live in production. This is a, just a quick demonstration showing that it's actually work. It's a graph showing the number of requests or authentication server. 
But the reason I'm uh, here telling you our story is because I think this story is not special to Soloto. I don't think we are the only one who faced this issue, who wanted to have authentication without affecting the user experience. And I want to share with you how we did it, and hopefully it will be relevant to you. And I also think that not only it's relevant to mobile, it's even more relevant to Internet of Things, to IoT. Whether it is smart refrigerator or smart camera, those are cases that uh, interactive login uh, is not always trivial. Either because you don't have a UI, or because it's weird. Why I have to enter my Twitter credentials or my Facebook credentials, the so that my smart refrigerator will be able to work. So this is the why, and before I explain how, I'm, how I did it at Saluto, uh, I'm going to explain what I want to achieve. So if in regular authentication we are talking about authenticating the user, and then use the user details, the user identifier, or something like that to perform authorization, I want to achieve something else. I want to be able to uh, authenticating the, the app on the device, the app running on the device, by some app unique identifier, uh, and then do authorization based on this identifier. Say, this app installation is allowed to this data, or allowed to perform this data. We do lose some information here because I might be able to say, okay, this app belongs to this user, but I will not be able to say who the user was actually performing the operation. But this fit our need at Saluto, uh, and again, I believe uh, this will be relevant to others too. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so as I said, we come up with a solution, and this solution is based on uh, three protocols, which is OpenID, Digital Signature, and One-Time Password. Uh, so I explain each one of those protocols in a very, very high level uh, because of the time limitation and how uh, I use those protocols to implement our solution. I stop for questions after each one, so in case you did not understand something, feel free to come and ask. It's really important to understand the full solution. And then I'll do a quick demo. Hopefully it will work. And then I'll discuss two edge cases that, uh, that our solution is able to handle. So this is the plan, and let's start. So as I said, I started to work on this project say, two years ago. And when I started to think about how we can do authentication, what exists out there, OpenID looked like a pretty trivial option for this. OpenID is a simple identity layer. Basically, it's a protocol that uh, describes how you can perform authentication and show user identity and stuff like that. And it sounds pretty much fit to what we need. Uh, and the authentication in OpenD is done using some tokens, some strings that you can press, and by this you are doing uh, authentication. We will see it in a minute when I explain OpenID. But the reason I wanted to use OpenID is because OpenID is widely support, meaning uh, no matter what stack we will use in our backend, it probably has some support for OpenID. So we have to write a lot, of, a lot less code. And also it's widely support, so it's already battle proven, it's already secure and stuff like that, and it's pretty important. And also OpenID is highly modular, and I'll explain what I mean by highly modular after I explain how OpenID works. So uh, how OpenID works, and I do now a really quick overview of OpenID. If you're not familiar with it, there is a full 40 minute session after to, later today about OpenID. So you're more than invited to check it out. OpenID is a really cool protocol. But anyway, open and did uh, talk about uh, three participants or three players, and the most important one is the authorization server. The authorization server is the one defined strictly by the protocol, all the requests and response to this server defined in the protocol, uh, and he's the one who actually hand doing the authentication. Except on the authorization server, we have our server, which is the application server, doing our logic, handling our data. And we have the device, which running our app or our web app or something like that. Now, let's say we want to authenticate the user. So the mobile app initiates an uh, authentication request to the authentication server. This is the step when the user actually does the login, uh, enter his Facebook credential, something like that. And if this authentication succeeds, the user will receive a token. Uh, this token will return to our app. And the app can use this token, again, this string, to authenticate the request with the authorization header. So it can, the app can send it to our server. And the server can do some sort of validation with our authorization server to make sure this token is valid. And if the token is valid, it can perform the request, return data, or something like that. 
So this is basically in a very, very high level how open they work. And it's so pretty fit to what we need. So I started to look how you can do authentication in OpenID. And basically the protocol also defined how you can do authentication in uh, OpenID. Uh, but each one of the available methods did not fit our needs. Because either it uh, required interactive login, which we don't want, or it required us to store the hard-coded credentials on the application code. And we also don't want that because anyone with the app code has the credentials, so it's not secure at all. So at that point, I understood that we need a new authentication uh, flow. If we will be able to perform this little component, to change this little component, we'll be able to enjoy the full benefits of OpenID. And that's what, why I say it's highly modular. You need to change small components, and you, have, you can use regular OpenID in all, our, all over the place, which is pretty cool. So what requirements we will have uh, for such an authentication solution? We started to think about what we want from the, this uh, solution. And the first one, which is the most trivial, is it has to be strong. We don't want something that is easy to break. The second one, as we already said, I want to have a way to uniquely identify the device. So I will, I will be able to perform authorization based on this device identifier or something like that. I also want it to be simple, because simple means less bugs, less vulnerabilities, easy to implement, stuff like that. Uh, I want it to be, I want that the authentication request will be unique per request, uh, meaning if an attacker were able to capture one authentication request and send it again, it will not work, what's called replay attack. And uh, the last one, which is also very important, I want, to have, I want it to be fault tolerant. I want that uh, our client will, will be able to recover from errors and not will just be hanged there without being able to authenticate after experience errors, because errors are expected. Uh, any questions about OpenID? Something not clear? OK. So we have OpenID. And now we need to find out how we are going to perform the authentication. And the next thing that uh, that's worth checking out is digital signature. And before I explain how we, uh, we wanted to use uh, digital signature, I do explain a quick high-level overview of digital signature. And I'm going to explain digital signature using both the builder because I have to hear all the time, so this is pretty much what I'm dealing with right now. Uh, to those of you who are not familiar about uh, the builder, uh, pretty shame on you, go see an episode. But anyway, this is Bob, and Bob has a crew of people helping him. So this is Leo. Leo is one of Bob's crew. Um, and let's say that Leo wants to send a message to Bob, and Bob wants to know that this message comes from Leo and not from someone else impersonating Leo. A pretty trivial cryptographic security problem. Anyway, what Leo can do is the following. Leo can uh, generate something called a uh, private key, and from this private key generate something called public key. Uh, private is red, public is green. Now Leo can give to Bob uh, the public key. Uh, he needs to address it in a secure way, so Bob will know for sure this is Leo's public key. And he needs to save the private key uh, safely, so no one else will have access to it. Now when Leo wants to send a message to Bob, uh, he can take the message. And using his private key, he can sign this message. The result of this signing process is the original message with something called signature. So this is not encryption. He sent the message to Bob clear text. If someone catch it, he can read the message. But it has something uh, in addition, which is this signature. When Bob receives the message and the signature, he can verify it with uh, Leo's public key. And if the verification with this public key succeeds, he can know that this message comes from Leo and not from someone else impersonating Leo. Why? Because the verification will succeed only and only if the message was signed with Leo's private key, because there is a relationship between the public and the private key. Now, if only Leo has the private key and no one else has it, he was the only one who was able to sign it. So only Leo was able to send this message. So this is very, very high level uh, overview of digital signature, which is also a pretty cool idea. And I'm sure a few of you are already thinking, oh, that's familiar. There is a pretty popular protocol uh, based on digital signature. How many of you can think on a popular protocol based on digital signature? Yes. <laughs> so yes, uh, HTTPS, or most uh, correct, 
SSL TLS in a very high level is based on a digital signature. And also there is a very popular library called OpenSSL, which is implementation of TLSSL. And the reason this is important is it means that uh, we can assume that any device in the world probably supports HTTPS. So we already have implementation for digital signature. We don't need to write digital signature our own, which is pretty cool when thinking about simplicity. Less code we need to write, more uh, good things are going to happen. So this is uh, why digital signature is going to be good for us. But how we can use digital signature? So let's say we have the device in the authorization server. And before the device will be able to request a token, he needs to perform a small step of registration, like in the first time you install the app or something like that. So the device, like Leo before, can generate the private and the public key and send the public key to the server with the device identifier, again, this number which is uniquely per device. The server can store the public key in its database, some key value store or something, something like that. And then when the device wants to authenticate, again, like Leo before, it can use the private key to sign something, some message, and it doesn't really matter what now, and send this signed message to the authorization server with its identifier. The server can fetch the matching public key to this identifier from the database and verify the signature. And if the signature is verified, if the signature match to this public key, he can know that, again, like Bob before, this message comes from this device ID and not from someone else impersonating him. Because the device keep this private key signature and return a token to the device. So we can see that from our initial list of requirements, we already fulfill a strong authentication solution because uh, digital signature is a pretty strong protocol. We have a unique way to identify the device because of the, of the private key. Only the device has this private key and no one else has it. And we have something that is simple, again, because of TLS SSL. So now we need to think about what we are going to sign. And we need to make sure that this thing we are going to sign will be a unique per request and fault tolerant. And before I explain what was our next idea, any questions about the English signature? Um, you don't need a CI here, but I can talk about it later if you want to come to me and explain to you why. Uh, does that mean that anyone can just fake clients and then start getting the authentication request? Anyone can register, but uh, we have a way to uniquely identify a device. Yeah, Oh, sorry. Uh, he asked if, uh, if, that, if that doesn't mean that uh, anyone can register. So, yes, anyone will be able to register, but he will, we, are, we are doing authorization. So he will be able to do the request only for his device and not for someone else. Again, sorry? You start with no And uh, When you first uh, register, then the, the yes. uniquely has no authorization at all? So uh, you ask if the registration has no authorization at all, right? So yes, you, we, well, I'm not handling uh, registration here. Anyone can register. It's a different problem. But uh, it's not a problem and it's interesting here. Because uh, also, if you can register, but uh, you will only be able to request a token for your device identifier. You will not be able to request that uh, belong to other devices. So you ask if the signature is going to be different if the message is the, is the same, right? So um, there is, a, a, it's like kind of, you can say it's like hashing at a very high level, so no. If the message is the same, the signature will be the same. So you ask uh, why, it is, uh, f why it's uh, protecting from fault tolerant? Uh, from replay attack, uh, and I explain why when I when I talk about what we are going to sign, we need to find what we are going to sign and make sure uh, it's uh, protect us from replay attack. Um, one last question, and then I continue. Let's keep this discussion uh, after that question because it's pretty complex one. It's another different, big, big problem. So come on, let and we talk about it. 
Okay, so uh, to continue your questions, how we can make sure um, that if someone captured this signature, we will not be able to uh, authenticate. So uh, uh, this time what we checked, the idea, the next uh, protocol which looks pretty fit, is one-time password. One-time password is a protocol or a set of protocols describing how you can generate a unique password on each request which is pretty much what we want, right? A way to create a new password each time, which our server is able to validate. So we might be able to use that as the message we are signing. Now, one-time password has two main popular implementation, which is time-based and counter-based. And the time-based is the most simple one. Uh, basically, you are taking the current timestamp on your client sign it with some signing algorithm and send it to your server. The server can validate the signature and then he can check that the time in some, is in some allowed value range. For example, plus minus one minutes, but it really doesn't matter what this range is. Um, so it's pretty simple and that's why it's also used uh, usually in a MFA solution like Google Authenticator. Um, the counter based is a bit more complex you start with some random seed, let's say seven, but it really doesn't matter which number it is. And after each request, uh, both the client and the server are increasing it. So it will be seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine. And like with time, also here we have a loud value range. So if the client uh, send a, sign the number two, and the number on the server is 10, you can see that 10 minus 2 is bigger than the allowed value range, than, than 5, so the request will not be valid. Anyway, those are the regular one-time password uh, solutions, but we I didn't want to use it, either one of them because they both had, had similar issue, which is synchronization issue. Uh, time is the Time is uh, complex because uh, with Rotor already now, we have mobile devices out there where their time is not synchronized. They one day before regular time or something like that. So if your time is not synchronized, you cannot create one-time password based on time. Um, and counter is even more problematic because if the client experienced a few errors, it will get out of sync. Uh, we will not be able to authenticate. So we want one-time password, but uh, we need to build a new one-time password protocol. And let's see how I did it. So as I said before, we have the registration step. And uh, I said that the client generate the private key and uh, send uh, the public key to the server. Yeah, sorry. Um, so the number is also, uh, if the, she asked what's the problem with the number base. So, um, if the client experienced a few errors, it will keep increasing the number and finally will get out of sync. It will not be able to authenticate. So uh, to return to this, I said that... Uh, we can keep this, this discussion after. Uh, I don't want to go, get too much into it right now, but it's a bit more complex than that. Anyway. Um, so I said that the, the client generate the private and the public key, send the public key to the server, and he can also generate uh, two random numbers, two crypto random numbers, that uh, I call them old and new, and he send them also to the server. So in the end of registration, the server has the public key and those two numbers, and the client has the private key and those two numbers. I will refer to them as payload through the rest of the session. Uh, now, before the uh, client can request a token, he needs to roll those, num those two numbers. And uh, the rolling is basically old get the value of new, so old become two. And new get new crypto under value, in this, in this case 42. Now, the client can sign this payload using the private key and send it to the server. <coughs> and the server can verify the signature with the public key, like I discussed before. And if the signature is valid, he can verify the payload. How we verify the payload? He need to check that old equal new, the client old equal to the server new, in this case two equal two. And if the equal the request is valid, 
and the server updated the payload in its database, so the next request will succeed, and he returned a token to the user. Uh, and you can see that uh, in addition to, to the three requirements we had before, we now add something that is unique per request. And I can say that it's also for tolerant. We will see why when I discuss the edge cases. Uh, any questions about this yes, solution? Yeah, I start from. Why, why the, the server needs the old, the, the old team, the old numbers? <coughs> when you are supplying the tool, the, 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 the So you ask why the server needs the old? So you will see why when I discuss about edge cases, but the old and new here are uh, required for uh, handling error cases. So we'll see why next. If I intercept your initial request for topics, okay, and I change, I, I generate my own pair, and I will give you your public, I, I broke all your mechanisms. So you ask if an attacker were able to intercept the first registration request and send another public key instead of the client public key, yes, you will be able to block the whole solution. Uh, we are, you're right. Um, we are protecting this with certificate pinning and stuff like that, but it's not uh, perfect. So I prefer to keep this discussion later because it will be a bit longer than just a quick response. You start to scale up, you are saving state for the server, so are you planning to approach that? You're asking about scaling up because we need to keep a lot of data. No, because now you have an authentication state on the server instead of just using your keeping everything inside the token. The only thing I kept on the server are those two numbers. You asked about keeping the state on the server. So you're asking about how we are keeping the state? If, no, I'm if you will scale up, like you need more ah. application server, then you have to sync the state. The so you're asking about scaling up and keeping the state? We're using database for that, and they are using the same database. And I can share more about the database later if you want to come talk with me. Yes? Um, you ask why I'm uh, letting the client choose the next numbers and not the server? Um, because it's... Again, sorry? The client is not? I didn't got the, the rest. Oh. Um, yes, but I trust the client to generate all the other stuff and I want to plan to generate a private key because if it's not generated a private key, I need to pass the private key on the on the wire, and I don't want to pass the private key on the wire. The private key never leaves the device. So if I can trust him to generate the private key, I think I can trust him to generate those two numbers. And it also makes things a bit more simpler. And, and again, let's take this question offline because we need to, you know, have a bit uh, bigger discussion there. Okay. So uh, now let's go over to the demo. Okay. So this is pretty much how the demo uh, is built. Um, it's pretty much like uh, OpenID before. Uh, we have the authorization server, the application server, and the client. Uh, the authorization server is built in .NET Core using a library called Identity Server. Identity Server is a full OpenID implementation. Uh, which is pretty cool because again, less code we need to write, only our uh, code and not the full open ID spec. Uh, the application server is also in .NET Core because it was a bit easier for me. And in the demo, it's basically an API that you can request sensitive data for me uh, for any device in the world and he does authorization. So you will get sensitive data only if you request it for the authenticated device. And we will see in the demo what I mean into it. And we have the client, which the client is written in Ruby, again, uh, simplicity, and is running on Raspberry Pi, which is this thing. 
a small computer credit card size which is here to simulate Internet of Things device. So let's see the demo in action. All the code available in GitHub, I'll put the link to the GitHub later. Okay, so the demo is running. Uh, it's running a bit slow because of the last reply. Okay, cool. So you can see that uh, we have the device identifier, uh, the number that identify it, and we can now request uh, sensitive data for any device ID in the world. So let's ask data for our device ID, 14587. And you will see that it's returned uh, data for us because this is our device. If I now just put random number, Okay, so you can see that I got unauthorized. This is this is a, I, this is how uh, I show I demo that we can do authorization. So the sensitive data, the sensitive API is able to authorize by the token this string that passed in the authorization header and said if you are authorized or not to this device data. Um, any question about it? Because I will not have time to go over the code. How do you generate device ID? Okay, so we ask how we are device ID. It's a lot of we are using GUID, but uh, it doesn't really matter. You can do whatever works for you. But once you have, let's say, if you are able to snoop device ID, you basically able to get the information? No, because of the authorization. You saw that I tried to ask uh, sensitive data for device ID 56, and it did not work. Why? Uh, because I. I explain, can't even explain to you either, and just don't have a lot of time for that. Um, I want to keep with the rest of the demo, uh, for the rest of the slides. Uh, so again, check out the repo on GitHub. It has the code and it's make it easier to understand it. But the point was to show that I am able to perform authorization. Anyway, let's go to the last part, which is dealing with edge cases. So the first side case I want to, uh, to discuss is handling errors. And we all know that network requests can fail uh, because of timeout, network failure, just server-side errors like database down. And in those cases, the client does not know what is the server state because either the request did not get to the server and therefore the server did not update its database, its state, or the request did not get to the server and the request did get to the server, and the server already updated the state. So the client doesn't know how to distinguish between those two states. And I'm now going to show how our protocol handles each one of those. And I start with the most simple one. Um, let's say the client sent an authentication request to the server, but for some reason did not get to there. And instead of returning a token, the client received an error. So here the client just can retry the request and he will receive a valid token because, because you can see that all the equal new. Nothing to do here. Let's talk about the more interesting solution, uh, case. Okay. So, if I, um, so the, uh, the client now uh, send a request and the request go to the server and the request is valid because all the equal new. But uh, for some reason, the client did not get a token, he got an error doesn't really matter why. Uh, now the client can retry over and over and over again until at some point he will be able to send a request to the server. Now you can see and it's related to the question of why we need the old, that old does not uh, equal new here, 2 does not equal 42, but uh, you can see that the world payload is equal, old equal old and new equal new. So this is a special case, the server expected this case, and he's assuming that what happened here is the client got out of sync. So in this case, the server just returned HTTP status code 400 by request, and the client is also expecting this uh, status code. So on this status code, the client just roll, like he does on success request, and if you roll, you will be able to see that now all the equal new, and the client were able to recover from this error and then give it okay. So this is how we handle errors. Um, 
Again, sorry. Um, you ask if this will be able to abuse for replay attack. So, uh, if you send the same request again, yes, it will be the same as this error case because it will be the same state. But you can see that it will does nothing on the server. The server does not change his state here, so it will does nothing here. You can do that. It's only affect uh, our load timers, the server handling time and DOS and stuff like that. It will not. You will not receive a token. So let's go to the last edge case, which is more interesting. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, your password, what happens if the device is stolen? So you're asking if, not, if I'm not using a password, what happens if the device is stolen? If you are able to store a device, of course, you will be able uh, to access the data. And yes, this is a problem with this whole solution. We're trying to do authentication without user interaction. So you are a bit limited with what you can do. Um, and it's pretty much assumption here. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm not taking more questions. I just want to get to have time for the last test case because it's also pretty interesting. And I want to talk about uh, there is a pretty easy way to break this solution, like what you're starting to ask about. Um, and this is what happens if someone is able to access the device privately or compromising the device. Uh, and if someone will be able to compromise the device, uh, will be able to impersonate this device and send a request uh, impersonating him. So as this is a pretty bad scenario, uh, I, saw, I want our protocol will be able to handle it. And to explain it, uh, I want to introduce Eve. Eve is the best hacker in the world. All she needs is like this uh, hoodie, put the hoodie on, use like terminal with green letters like in any good movie, and she can hack into any device in the world. It doesn't really need to be connected to the internet. And uh, let's say that if we're able to compromise one of our devices, and now we have client, server, and if, you can see that client and if both has the private key and both has the same state. Now, if if will request a token, you can see that all the equal new, and she will receive a token. Now you can also see that if know our protocol, so she already wrote the payload. What will happen if the client will request the token? So if the client will request a token now, you can see that it's the same as the error case before. Uh, he will receive 400 uh, bad status codes because the payload is equal. And he can roll now. Uh, notice that if the server and the client, each one has a bit different state. So it means that now the client will be able to request a token because all the equal new. But the next time if will request a token, something different will, be, will happen. You can see that it's almost like the error, cost, uh, error case I discussed before, but it's not the same. Because the new does not equal 78, does not equal 93. So in this case, the server responds with panic. And you can assume that something bad happened. And instead uh, of just returning bad requests to the client and not exposing information, he can also revoke this client totally, so no one will be able to authenticate, and uh, send some alert, so someone will be able to go and check out what happened. Uh, I saw four questions at the end, because uh, I don't have a lot of time. So I'll stop for questions at the end, because I don't, want ha I don't have a lot of time, so I want to complete the presentation, and then stop for questions. Uh, so now we'll do a quick conclusion. Before the conclusion, uh, reminding about the responsive of the solution. We really want feedback about the solution. This is why we are sharing it. And we want to hear about potential issues. But if you have some ideas, uh, come talk with me, uh, Twitter, whatever. I will provide you the way to uh, responsible disclose such issues. And again, we really want to hear them. Anyway, those are the requirements we started with. And I hope you can see that uh, the solutions fulfill all of them which means uh, we now have a way to uniquely authenticate the device and use the full OpenID scenario, a solution. And maybe if the guys from Nissan if know about the solution, maybe they use it, maybe it will help them. Anyway, I do hope that you ask, you're asking yourself how you can use it. And if this is the case, we are thinking about releasing, uh, we are working about releasing part of the solution, the backend and the client to open source. <laughs> So feel free to tweet me uh, open issues on the demo on the demo GitHub page, 
and uh, just to let us know that you want it, what you need, it will help us to provide the, the right open source. And that's it, thank you. And if there are questions, I have like four minutes for them. Questions? And, uh, Again, sorry? How, how device, uh, so you ask how the device gets the device ID? And the device simply generates the device ID. Here it's a lot of we are using uh, GUID, but you can use whatever you want. So if, if I'm creating a script that will... Again, sorry? If I'm creating a script that will go through, you know, uh, the loop that will generate ideas and then send five keys, wouldn't I uh, do a denial of service? So yes, if, if you are going to write a script that will just go over all the ideas in the world and send them to us, yes, you will be able to DOS us. That's why you are, we are using GUID, which is pretty hard, not that hard, but pretty hard to go over all the GUID in the world. Uh, but yes, uh, this is again an uh, issue related to how you are authenticating the first registration request, because this is the only request you cannot authenticate. Um, but yes, that's correct. So you're asking what will happen if Eve is the one who does two requests instead of the client. And in this case, the client will be the one who will trigger the alert. So I don't really care if Eve or the client trigger the alert. I just want that one of them will do it. Yeah. Again, sorry, I did not get you. So you're asking how we are doing basically ACL, access control, right? Yeah, yeah so you can use OpenID for that. Come to me later and I can explain you a bit how we can use OpenID for that. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. The next talk will begin in 10 minutes. Oh, there you are. At 11.15, we're going to begin.